I'm Rusty Holden. I'm from Therenco. I'm talking about the Little Lifter, a pilot plant that I designed computationally in the last couple of months. An overview on where we go next because we have to do a little materials testing. This is 40 megawatts. Here's our defining differences. The neutrons converting thorium directly to uranium-233. Also in the pure design which I have here, we're not producing any plutonium to speak of or any of the other dreaded transuranics, the usual suspects, the contamination issue for thousands of years. Uh, with the liquid, the defining difference, no meltdown, no fuel rods, no cooling ponds, and again, no 10,000 year fuel storage problems. Finally, with the liquid fuels, we have the safety situation pretty much in hand. You've seen the, the fuel dump that has been discussed. This is when the hot fuel drops down into the tanks during the unforeseeable emergency situation. Uh, my only improvement on that is to salt the tank uh, that receives the hot fuel with denaturing materials and with dilutants and with neutron absorbers, but we'll get to that in a moment. Here we go, how do we start this thing? I picked a molten salt sodium beryllium fluoride. I'm using this one because it's inexpensive readily available, and you don't have to do any isotopic separation. As in the case of lithium, you have to fish out the lithium-6. In this, you don't. There is a penalty. There's a little bit of a, a neutron cost in the economy here, but I, I think this is a good salt to look at. It's excellent because it's got a very long liquid range, 350 degrees to 1500 degrees. That's good. It gives an operating range between 450 and 650, which is good, it doesn't strain the materials. The nice thing also is this is a low power design. I want to test the materials, I want to do it inexpensively. So we got natural convection that we can do with a pool type reactor design. What's our fuel? This is easy. All we do is we get our coolant, our sodium beryllium fluoride, and we add our fissile to it. In this case, it's pure U-235. We add our fertile, which is our, our thorium tetrafluoride. And I examined some cases just varying the amount of thorium uh, in the fuel. The good news is this, the more thorium, the better the fuel. Here's the liquid fuel characteristics. It's melted around 400 degrees. We can adjust that melting temperature by adding additional fluoride salts so we can have a lower melt. We can do that also with the coolant. We can adjust the melting temperature with relative ease. The fuel is compatible with the coolant because it's made out of the coolant and it's compatible with the Hastelloy nickel cladding, the material that's absolutely necessary to separate your coolant from your fuel. You don't want to contaminate your coolant because then if you have that possibility, you're not going to be in business ever. In this reactor design, I use the beryllium in the salt as the moderator. So I sidestep having moderator in the, the molten salt assembly. I don't have graphite sitting in the core. It makes a smaller design. This is the conceptual honeycomb geometry. This is new geometry. The honey is the yellow. That's the coolant coming your way. The blue is the thorium. That's your neutron reflector, your blanket. It's kicking those neutrons back into the core. And the red is the fuel circulating in the hastelloy lattice. In this chart we'll say that we're pumping the fuel north uh, and then the honeycomb, we're looking down on the reactor and the honey's coming our way. That's our coolant. The reason we have this geometry is for the thermal management. Hastelloy does not conduct heat as well as many of the other more traditional materials do. So I increase the surface area of our cladding so that we uh, achieve a nice uh, result. We have the fuel pump throughout the lattice. Also, with this lattice design, we have a cover gas in our fuel, and we're pumping that cover gas around. And this is the way we fish out our fission gases. The, your fission gases are sort of the parents of many of the fission products. And this is a superior way to clean and condition your fuel during operations, is to manage that gas. And, and the easiest way to do it is, is to circulate a cover gas sitting on top. Here's the computational innovation here. This shows you in detail what the hex cell system looks like. The green is the fuel. We're pumping it north again. 
Uh, the honey, the yellow, is coming your way. That's the coolant. And your fuel, and the hastaloy is the magenta. Uh, it's, oh. it's your cladding that's separating fuel from coolant. We see what the core looks like. We're at 160 centimeters across the hexagonal shape. It's a right hexagonal prism, so it's 160 centimeters tall and 160 centimeters across the shoulders. The openings in the lattice are on four uh, centimeter segments. Uh, they're there because that's the mean free path of the neutrons in this particular assembly. We put my hex system where it says reactor core. It heats up that chimney full of salt. The salt goes up to the top, visits the heat exchanger, gets cooled, goes back down. That's your primary loop. Your salt is in an endless circle here. And inside of this flask, I call it a thermal reservoir. We, ha we have a lot of heat that we store. And the way we fish it out is with the heat exchangers. In the secondary loop, probably a critical CO2 Brayton heat exchange. Whatever the most efficient is, I like the gas because your, your hardware is a lot smaller and a lot more efficient. I keep my uh, c traditional control rods and, and safety rods, that sort of thing. I keep it there for regulatory reasons. Uh, it's, it's good to have traditional control in addition to all the other controls uh, we've designed that are new. But this provides a nice transition from the, the old to the new, is using the tried and true control. Gives us a good uh, shot at having regulatory success. This is what the neutrons look like in the fuel. Horizontal scale is increasing energy, it goes up to 10 million electron volts. Way down on this end, a tenth or so of electron volt. Tiny electron volts. The green shows you thorium's appetite or affinity for neutrons as a function of energy. Uh, and the red shows you affinity by uranium-233 in this case for neutrons. You see, uranium loves those colder, those, those chilled out or thermal neutrons at a little bit below one electron volt. The idea of this thing, what, what makes it go, is you have to have enough thermalized neutrons to keep that neutron chain reaction going. But also, you want to be able to make as, as much fuel as you can on the go. So that's why I like a little higher spectrum here, or this is a pretty hard spectrum. And what's going on is we're getting lots of opportunity for the neutrons to be captured by the thorium so that we can almost, we can get towards a break-even situation of producing as much uh, fissile material as we consume during reactor operations. There are many advantages, of course, it's great making the fissile right in the core because that's the safest place in the world for fissile because it's protected by radiation shield. What happened with these three fuel designs, the one on there is when your reactor is critical. When you go below one, that means your reactor's fizzled out. The fission products have, have won the battle and now you just got a bunch of embers. The more thorium that's in the fuel, the longer it's going to last, the longer it's going to stay above one. These computations were done without pulling the fission gases out. My next set of computations will be using conditioned fuel to flatten out this chart so that my fuel will be very, very long lived. Many decades, probably, of fuel. The idea of this is to keep the fuel in the plant not take it away from the plant. Regulators like that, that's a good idea. The way to do that is condition that fuel. You can, I've talked about the fission gases. You, you catch, capture them outside the core. The trick is you just pull them out, run them through a cold box, and you, your fission gases will get stuck in the cold. They'll, they'll come out, and then they'll drop down into the, the fission product solids that uh, are the uh, neutron poisons. This was our uh, performance, the low power test, uh, 10 megawatts. We burned up 141 keys of U-233 in this exercise. When we produced about 102 kilograms of U-233. We have a big fissile load with this thing, 1.6 metric tons. That's high, but that's the, that's the price of having a fuel that can be made eternal, being able to work in the harder spectrum rather than a soft or thermalized spectrum. We have nine tons of thorium in here, 
and we produced 23 grams of U-232. That's the stuff that shows to the world. It sends out a gamma signal. You can see it from a satellite way out in space or instruments on a boat or on the ground. It says there's uranium-233 here. It's hot. If you've tried to run off with it, it's a dead giveaway. And if you try to build a, a bomb out of it, it provides a nice way to come in with uh, some countermeasure that sees those photons and will zoom right in and zap wherever that uh, unaccounted for uranium is. Here's our transuranics. Transuranics are usual suspects. Plutonium-239, it hangs out for 24,110 year half-life. Takes it quite a long time to fizzle out. These figures show 10 to the minus 7, 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 7, 10 to the minus 9 grams. This is teeny, teeny production. I got lazy when I, I did the addition here. I said less than a milligram. Well, it's significantly less than a milligram, a thousandth of a gram of these dreaded materials, 10 years of operation under K6. This is good. Waste profile, much healthier. All we have to worry about is the fission products, and we've already captured a lot of those fission products in that cold box, and we, we, we have a, a much more workable situation here. Now, here's the fuel dump. We have vertical pipes that connect the hex cell array to the safety drums. These are the emergency drums. We can't foresee every kind of black swan, when it's going to show up, when it's going to show up, and what it's going to be. So uh, under this system, we can trip the emergency switch, either by the operator, if he's still there, or a seismic signal comes through, or a thermal signal comes through. In other words, the fuel's too hot. So it can melt through a plug uh, or there are other, other methods as the temperature of the fuel increases, Curie points of magnetic materials can be exceeded and circuits opened and, and physical circuits opened so we can dump that fuel right down into the tank. And there is the denaturant uranium-238 sitting right in the tank in gravel form. It melts into the fuel denaturing it. Uh, we have cadmium fluoride in the gravel in the tank. It's there grabbing the excess thermal neutrons, taking them out of circulation. We also have additional dilutants in the tank. We can use the coolant, or there are some other uh, dilutants that are low melting uh, fluoride compounds that can solve the afterheat problem immediately because we're changing the density of the fuel or the, the density of the fission products we're making them more rare in the material so we can handle this thing uh, with passive air cooling. It's just uh, like a bunch of uh, drums sitting in the air. There's an, as long as the air can circulate, there's enough cooling so that we don't have uh, a problem controlling that after heat as we've seen in Japan and elsewhere. Here's our specs a little bit. Our prism, it's five foot two. That's what 160 centimeters, so five foot two tall five foot two wide. Our fuel volume is uh, 615 gallons. That's, we all understand gallons, the leaders always escape me, but that's all there is, 615. We've got a lot of coolant in this design of mine because what we're trying to do is, is make that thermal reservoir because then you get load following effects, sort of money in the bank with a big hot thermos full of salt. 93,000 liters, that's about 25,000 gallons of hot salt. And then our reflectors are thorium. In this case, it was solid. I got 16 tons of reflector there. The reflector is salted also with a little bit of uranium-238 so that the uranium-233 produced in the reflector is denatured. The advantage of remote fuel handling, this is for the people, that, the plant workers. They don't have to be exposed to the fuel the way plant workers are today to the fuel. We can uh, pump it around capture those fission gases during operations remotely. We uh, have the emergency situation of let's get that fuel cocooned. There it is again. It drops into the drums. We got the dilutant, dinaturant, and we've got our neutron absorbing materials and gamma shielding right in the drums. We're ready to go. We're prepared for an emergency. The proliferation hardening on this one, that U-232 sends out that signal. So if somebody's tried to run off with it, we can catch them pretty easily. We've got protactinium in the fuel. This is the 
intermediate between thorium and uranium-233. It sends out a bright gamma cascade. It provides a very strong radiation shield. It's got a one-month half-life, so there's about a three-month period where that fuel is gamma hot. In addition, there will be some other fission products in that fuel, and they will also be adding to the, the radiation shield. So if you can't uh, safeguard your fuel in three months, you're not running a good country, put it that way. For the proliferation community, the guys that are always worried about people running off with the fuel, if there's a problem, we've denatured it. The fuel cannot be weaponized. So here's the trick, is, is as long as we don't have uranium-238 in the fuel during operations, we're avoiding making the plutonium and the transuranics which is good, it's being a good steward. Uh, but to manage the, the other side, the dark side, the guys who want to make weapons and stuff, then we've got to contaminate the fuel. My argument is, let's contaminate it only in the emergency situation when we have to, and, and that provides a much better environmental footprint for this type of nuclear fuel. Also, we have the active control features in this thing. I pointed out we have control rods and that sort of thing. This is, makes it easy on the regulatory community. They see something familiar. Codes exist to manage the regulatory side of things, or the controlling of this thing, using standard neutron absorbers in the reactor area. Again, the fuel quality is managed, conditioned during operations. So we can add that fissile. We can remove the fissile. We can also add and remove the fertile. The nice thing is we can get those fission gases and capture them and keep those fission products out of our fuel. Here's the thank you notes. This goes to uh, uh, my friend Rick Whitman up at PNNL, who's done computational work for me for about six years now. Uh, we've got it pretty well figured out how to optimize these things. Dr. Birchfield did the review for this speech to make sure I didn't misstate anything. The Department of Energy and PNNL provided the, the funding for the program. I thank the Alliance for the Podium today. And there's just one more thing. Thorium developers, uh, remember we're, we're in a, a regulated area here, okay, because we make uranium-233. Any thorium developer in the room, make a note. Talk to your lawyer about 10 CFR 810. We've got export controls and so forth that come from the proliferation treaties and, and other uh, international instruments. All you have to do is get permission to do what you're planning to do, and you have to disclose who you're working with. But if you don't do that, if you try to, you know, do it, uh, circumvent it, uh, you might get on the wrong side of the law, and who wants that? I mean, the, the, the penalties are 10 years to life. Let's pay attention to that. Thank you very much. I'm Rusty Holden, and it's time for the next speech. Thank you, Rusty.